Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath that we can come apart from the things that keep us so busy during the week. And we ask, Father, as we take this time, we are taking this time to meet with you. And we ask that your spirit be especially close to us. And Father, help us to, to discern truth and error. Father, there's things that we all believe and understand that are not 100%, and we are here seeking knowledge and wisdom. We pray that you be close to us. We ask that you cleanse our hearts and minds, that you can truly work in us and through us. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. So we have been looking at a concept here for the last few weeks, I guess. We were looking at the, the millennium, the second coming, and the judgment that's going to happen. Uh, not only the judgment at the very end in Revelation chapter 20, which we're going to look at, we're going to kind of zero in on that today, uh, but also the judgment that happens prior to the second coming. So there's actually two judgments that are going to happen, and somebody might think, well, why two? Well, because Scripture records two. And so we can just leave it with God and just say, okay, well, that's the way he's determined that it's going to work. Um, but I'm not, I'm not quite ready to, to say that. I have to, in my mind, I have to have clarity on what's going to happen and why it's going to happen. Why, why has Jehovah set this system up the way he has? Why, are, why do things happen at the time appointed that he has made? Uh, the, so the, the question is, it, could there be any other way that he could have formulated this plan of salvation uh, that maybe he's overlooked? Maybe he could have shortened it up or, you know, gave people a little more chance at salvation. Why is it that it is exactly the way it's recorded? And he has shown us how it's going to, to conclude. And he's showed, shown us all along the way on how and when things are going to happen. Now, I think that's, that's pretty neat that we can actually know in advance of what's going to happen. He obviously knows in advance. He knows the end from the beginning. And lo and behold, he's made that known in his word. And I praise him for that because I'm kind of a curious guy. I like to know the whys and wherefores of things. And so searching these things out, there are answers. And, you know, a lot of people will say, if you don't have an answer for a certain question, they say, well, you know, God hasn't revealed that to us, and we just need to accept that. And I say that can turn into a cop-out pretty easily. So that I could say, as a, as a teacher of the Word, one of many, I could say, well, you know, somebody asked me a question, and I could say, well, you know, I don't know the answer to that, so obviously it's not important. If I don't know, it can't be important. So that is just a bad way to look at things. Now, in order to have answers to questions, you have to do the homework and you have to do the research to have an answer. And we don't want to make it up as we go. If we don't know what the answer is, we should just say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that one. But if we've done the homework and somebody asks us a question, we're supposed to be able to give them an answer. That's what Peter said. Be always ready to give an answer for your faith. Now, that doesn't mean that just talking about Yeshua. My faith involves more than Yeshua, although Yeshua is the sum total, obviously, of everything. He is everything. But the idea is his plan when people ask me something about his plan of salvation and some of the details that are going to happen over the period of now to the end of the millennium, I should be able to give an answer to that person. If I cannot give an answer on something that I believe, 
then I should just leave it undone. In fact, I should say, you know, I can't prove this, uh, but this is what I believe. And the thing is, if we can't prove it, I have to ask the question, why do we believe it? Because it's as good as hearsay if I can't prove it. And so everything that I think is important that people need to understand, I need to have a basis for that belief. And of course, the Word of God is the only basis that we have, the only solid foundation that we have, that we have to base all of our understanding of not only what truth is, but who God is and how he has laid out this plan of salvation. We have two ways to do that, basically. We have prophecy. We can see in prophecy. We can see how he's acted in the past. And we can see how he's going to act in the future. And that gives us an idea of who God is. So through prophecy, through how he has acted in the past, foretold the future, and those things came to pass, gives us confidence as we move forward in the future that things are going to happen exactly the way they have. And we're told that Yeshua is the same from before, now, and forever. So the, all the time frame is God works the same way, and this is what we're looking at here. We've been looking at the judgment. I've called this forcing the hand of Jehovah. There's at a certain point, and we can see this in history, and this is what we looked at uh, prior to this uh, last week. If you haven't seen that, I really recommend that you, you watch that one. Uh, we can see in times past that God has worked certain ways. And this is really important because if we understand how he's worked in the past, it gives us a, a good understanding of how he's going to work in the future because he never changes his ways. So we've been looking at how does God, Jehovah, execute judgment? Well, there's a, there's a couple of main ways that he executes judgment. We have seen um, in the Bible that there was three main captivities, if you will. The Assyrian captivity, 722, I believe that was when it culminated. It lasted over approximately 10 years where the Assyrian uh, king was coming in, taking more land back. But it culminated in about 722. The Babylonian captivity uh, began in 605. Then they came back because they were being uh, mischievous, you might say. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in uh, 586. So the first captivity was 605. That's when Daniel and his friends were taken captive. And then Ezekiel, I believe it was at uh, 586 when Ezekiel was taken captive. And uh, that was during that time frame. And then the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and the Jews again were spread to the four winds of heaven, to the corners of the earth. And, and so those were really three captivities uh, in a sense. And then when we look at how that happened and why it happened, well, Kings is pretty clear. When Israel went away from God, and worshipped other gods, he gave them over to those other gods, and um, those other gods were worshipped by the other kings of the world, and God allowed, he allowed those other nations to come in and take them captive by those other kingdoms that worshipped those gods that Israel was always uh, looking to and and trying to emulate the other kingdoms of the world. And so he really, you know, it, it can be debated on what actually happened. While Israel was obedient, God could have impressed the other kings of the world as, let's just leave Israel alone, they're not causing any trouble. And, and all of these ideas are, are probably partially true. And so the other kingdoms did not interfere with Israel. Uh, in those times of their prosperity. But when they turned their backs on, on them, it would seem that somehow God removed the way he was working with these other kings and he allowed them, 
whether he impressed them to come in, that could be debated, but he allowed them to come in. So his hand of protection was removed and these other kings came in. We see this exactly the same thing in the book of Revelation in chapter 17 when the harlot, and we're not going to get into this, we're not going to really unpack it, it's just a, a comparison, is the harlot of Revelation 17, it's the ten kings that come in and destroy the harlot of Babylon, and it says because God has put it in their hearts to do this. So it's the same type of thing. Uh, we could overlay that possibly in these three captivities. So God removes his protection, maybe impresses others to make a judgment on his people, and they come in and lay destruction uh, upon Israel. There's another um, main way that God executes judgment, and that's when he takes it upon himself. In other words, he's not going to let anyone do this. He's going to take the reins into his own hands, because nobody, obviously, in my mind, what that means is nobody can do it the way God does it. Because his judgment is perfectly righteous. And, and some people have a hard time. We're going to be looking at those concepts. Is a righteous judgment. And some people say, well, judgment, if, it's, if it calls for the destruction of people... How could it be righteous? But the Bible puts righteousness and judgment together in the same sentence, and he put, it puts those two words right together, demonstrating that there is a time when God will work, and he will cause judgment to happen. He will execute the judgment, the sentence, upon people, and it will be righteous at the same time. And people have a hard time with that. How can God execute judgment, which is the destruction of people and angels. We're going to see that culminating at the end. How can he do that and still be righteous? Well, the Bible teaches that he can do that and still be righteous. And the neatest thing about this whole story is that God is going to allow us to actually check him out to see if his judgments are actually righteous. And he has to do this. Uh, his system, his character requires that he do that. And he's going to do that. We're going to see that as we go. So there's three examples here that I'm going to pick up. And there's, there's a whole host of more examples that we're not using, you know, just a, a minimal just to, to make the point here. But these are good examples uh, for good reason. God executes judgment for himself when the cup of iniquity is full. In other words, when people have made up their minds that they will not change, no matter how much evidence, no matter how much truth you put before them, they will not change. At that point, God will execute judgment. And sometimes it happens in this life. But ultimately, it will happen, and we're going to look at some, some of these instances when it, when it has happened. The flood being one, I think it's six or seven times. God says, I myself, we looked at this last week, will destroy all flesh. Very clear that God took it upon himself. He said, I myself um, will destroy all flesh. And when I've used this example before, I used to do uh, electrical work, electrical contracting work, and I had people at times working for me, and they would go wire a house or wire a building, and I would send them, and my name would be on the van, so they were representing me. That happens. But sometimes if it was a customer that I knew really well, a good friend or whatever, I would go myself and do his job. And I would say, you know, I myself am going to be there or I'm going to send somebody else to do it. And God does exactly the same thing. However, if I send somebody else, it's as good as I did it myself. And, but there are times when God says, I myself am, I, uh, am going to do this. So at the time of the flood, we saw this. The, uh, the earth was broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So water came up from the earth. It also came down from the sky. And that's uh, very clear in that story 
and God takes full responsibility saying that I did this myself, probably because no one else was capable of doing this. Maybe not even the angels were capable of doing the, bringing this flood of waters upon the earth. Uh, also Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, God says, you know, he wants to go down. He had a little conversation with Abraham and two angels, and they went to check it out. And lo and behold, it was as determined that Sodom and Gomorrah had come to an end. Their cup of iniquity had filled up to the brim and was overflowing in wickedness. And uh, I believe at that point, they had determined that they would not, uh, not repent. And this became clear when they knocked on Lot's door. It was very clear that they only had evil uh, on their minds. And the flood is an example of that also. It says on, their thoughts were on evil continually. In other words, there was not a thought of doing the right thing at all. It was just how bad they could be. And this is the same point of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God rained down fire and brimstone on the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the other cities uh, that were involved as well in this same thing. Uh, the other one we looked at last week was Joshua's long day when uh, God uh, recorded, had recorded in his word that he threw uh, fire uh, hailstones down on these five kings and destroyed them. In fact, it says more were destroyed of the hailstones that God threw down than of the children of Israel that they slew. So God was definitely involved in this. And we saw some texts where Abraham was told uh, 400 plus years earlier that Israel would come back as a nation and come back into the land that he, they had, God had swore Abraham. And he would give them that land. And that was when the cup of iniquity would be full. The uh, Amorites and, and all these nations they had completely rejected God and it was time for their destruction because they had completely rejected God and they would not repent. And as we see the, the, uh, the stories as, as Joshua has had them recorded, that these kings were not in any way going to surrender to the God of Israel. And there's a, something that was very interesting in my mind is that when Joshua came to Jericho, uh, he had the, the, uh, his army go out, and they surrounded the city. They walked around the city for seven days. And what was out front? Does anyone remember what was out front uh, of the procession as they marched around? The Ark of the Covenant. Exactly, the Ark of the Covenant. And so that represented God's throne. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's throne and also his law because inside the Ark were the Ten Commandments and the Torah was also there as well on the side of the Ark. And so what this was, what this was really was their last call to repentance and they would not surrender to the throne of God and to his laws. And that's what you know, if you want to take it as what our job here is at the end is to represent the government of God in order for the nations to see that God's law is righteous and he is worthy to be served. And that's, that's kind of a type. So all these are types, actually, of the end destruction of the wicked when their cup is full. And Yeshua quotes Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood saying that they are types. Peter also and Jude uh, quote this as well, saying that they are types of the destruction in the time of the end. So we know that judgment is coming and destruction is coming, and we want to understand that so that we can make a conscious decision, a good decision, to be on the right side of the issue when it actually happens. And that's what we've been given an opportunity to do now, and in my mind, the more we understand this, the, the better position we are to make good decisions. All right, so now we're jumping a little bit into the, old, uh, to the New Testament. And of course, you can't go into the 
New Testament, and we're going to be bouncing back and forth a little bit. Uh, we were basically focused primarily in the um, book of Revelation last week and the, in the Old Testament. But now we're going to be looking at some of the other writings in the New Testament and see what they have said. In this case, it's Paul. What has he said about this judgment that's coming? 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, and 5. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. This is the, the fruit of the faith, is what this is. And Paul's commending them for that. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So the proof of their faith was through the persecutions and tribulations that they are enduring, that they're putting up with. This word endure is a very interesting word. Uh, they're actually putting up with this. Why are they putting up with this? Because they understand the rest of the story. It's an understanding of the rest of the story that helps us in our persecution. We understand, according to Yeshua, that there's going to be a persecution such as there never was since there was a nation. Well, our patience and faith is going to have to be very strong in that time. So we're going to have to know and understand uh, everything that we can about what the truth is in, about what's coming. And that's why Yeshua promised us that when the Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth and he will show you things to come. So that's important that we know all truth as much as we can get. And somebody might say, well, I don't need to know all truth. Well, according to Yeshua, we do need to know all truth. God does not do things willy-nilly. He said that in the time of the end, we will know all truth. We're shown that in other places as well, especially in Daniel. And uh, so he said we will know all truth when the Spirit comes and he will show us things to come. So we need to know the truth because what's coming we're going to have to know and be grounded in the truth because persecutions, unlike the world has ever seen, are coming and we're going to have to endure it. We're going to have to put up with it in this time. How are we going to do that? I propose that it's the knowledge that we have that we have changed our mind on the way we think and we have let the knowledge of the truth change us and it will give us that enduring and that fortitude that we're going to have to have at that time okay so let's let's move on here verse five which is manifest evidence this is one of the key points here he's getting to because of the persecutions and tribulations that we endure which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of god that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Now, a lot of times we just read this. We don't actually take apart what it's saying. Let's look at this a little closer. This word judgment, we're going to look at it. I just wanted to bring it out here, 2920. We're going to have a look at this, what this word means here. But uh, in a little bit, we're going to see how it's used in other places and see what it actually means. So... The saints are suffering persecutions and tribulations, and they're enduring it, which is the manifest evidence. So because of the persecutions, that's evident that God's judgment that he's going to execute on the wicked is righteous. That's exactly what it's saying. We're going to see that here. You might say, well, how do you get that? Well, we're going to see exactly how, how we get that. So he says, because of the persecutions that the saints are enduring and the tribulation that they're being forced to endure and hang on to their faith, that demonstrates that God is going to be righteous when he executes judgment on those that are doing the persecuting of the saints. 
That word 2920, subjectively or objectively, for or against, by extension a tribunal, by implication justice, specifically divine law, accusation, condemnation, damnation, and judgment. That's what that word is. So when God executes this condemnation or damnation on the wicked, it's going to be a righteous one, and that's because, in a sense, the wicked who have been persecuting and executing God's people have earned this judgment, and that is why it's righteous. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 8, we move on, it says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So it's very interesting that God is going to repay those who trouble us because of our faith. He's going to repay them with tribulation. So the way he repays it, very interesting. He will bring tribulation in this life, but he's also going to bring an executive phase of judgment on the wicked in their next life. Follow me closely now. So if they die in this life, they're going to be raised to a judgment of condemnation. The Bible is very, very clear on this, and we're going to be looking at those texts. So, but God is very, very just in that he will bring some kind of retribution on the wicked in this life, in this life, and also in the life to come for them, because they will all live again. We're going to be looking at that and showing biblically how that's going to happen. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Yeshua is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So God is going to give, he's going to repay with tribulation those that trouble us. And then when he comes, he's going to give us rest. Rest from what? Rest from the persecutions. That's actually when he's going to give us rest. Well, when we get to the book of Revelation, we're going to see something very interesting, is that those who are alive, there's going to be two groups when Yeshua shows up, those that are wicked that are unrighteous, and those that are righteous when he comes, he will take them up, and we're going to see that. So there's going to be two groups. There's going to be the wicked, and there's going to be the righteous. Well, the wicked are going to be repaid with tribulation, and this is how they're going to be repaid with tribulation. They're going to be repaid, and it's called the seven last plagues. That is, the seven last plagues are poured out on the wicked prior to the time when Yeshua comes back. And that will actually give us a little bit of relief from our persecutions because it's going to cause a distraction uh, for the wicked at that time because they're suffering the judgment of God in the seven last plagues. And we're going to see what happens after that. Then it goes on to say, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God on, and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah. So when Yeshua comes back, there will be, again, two groups. There will be the righteous living and the wicked living. The flaming fire and taking vengeance on the wicked living. So they will perish when he comes back. Revelation 19, which we're going to get to, very, very clear that all those who do not obey the gospel of Yeshua will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. And somebody might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Don't they get another chance when Yeshua comes back? Well, we get a chance every day on which side we want to we stand on. But the reality of it is we're going into a time unlike any time in earth's history. In the past, it says that God has winked at the times of ignorance. But not so with the time of the end. There will be no excuse for ignorance because Yeshua said before his return, it, he said that the gospel of the kingdom will go to all the world and then the end will come. You see, we're going into a time when the gospel of the kingdom will be known in all the world. 
It doesn't say that it will be accepted in all of the world. It just says that everyone will have opportunity to know what the truth is. There will be those that brace themselves against it and will turn an eye from that, turn their ears from it, and reject the, the gospel message. And at that time, they will be rejected. Uh, their salvation will be rejected. A judgment will happen, and they will be found wanting in that judgment that's going to happen prior to Yeshua comes back. It t it, we're told in Revelation 19 that Yeshua's reward is with him when he returns. Well, that reward could come in condemnation and destruction or a reward uh, for those that are alive and are righteous. They will have salvation. And the Bible talks about that in the book of Hebrews, which we're going to get to a uh, little bit down the road. So we can see the two groups God is going to take uh, uh, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel because they have rejected their opportunity. They love the wages of sin and unrighteousness. And uh, they would not let their sin go, even though they knew the truth. People will not be able to plead ignorance at that time. Goes on in uh, 2 Thessalonians, it says um, in verse 9 and 10, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So his testimony, Paul's testimony among the saints was such that there was enough truth that motivated them to turn from their sins and accept God's gospel, if you will, his plan of salvation for their lives. And they completely did 180 degrees turn and they turned from the ways of the world and went to the ways of righteousness. And that's when God will be glorified in his saints to have them to be displayed to the universe in that day, for they have held on to their faith through all of this persecution. And the righteous judgment, Paul calls it, when God destroys uh, the wicked at his second coming. So here we see that the destruction of the wicked is called a righteous judgment judgment. Why? We may not understand that completely, but as we study, we can see clearly that it is a righteous judgment. They have come to the place, no matter how much time they would be given, no matter how many days of probation, more, even years, thousands of years, more, they would not choose God because their minds have been hardwired in the ways of wickedness and that every thought of their mind, just as the time of the flood, Yeshua said, as in the days of Noah, their thoughts were on evil continually. In other words, evil actually consumed their whole beings, and they had no more right to life. And what God does, in essence, is he removes the life-giving force, the breath of life, from them when he comes. He's done that. He will have done that two ways. Uh, in the past, he's done it with the flood. And then it says that he will not destroy the same way he's done at the time of the flood. And then Sodom and Gomorrah is the second way he's going to do this. And we're told that that is an example upon for all those of what he will do in the time of the end. Whether you die in water or whether you die in fire your breath is taken away. You remember when Yeshua died? It says he gave up the ghost or he gave up his breath. That's what that's talking about. The life-giving force, the breath of life that Adam had breathed into, that God had breathed into Adam's nostrils was taken away in times past just the same way it will be taken away, uh, whether it's by water or fire. 
your breath is taken away. And it's basically, if we can go by Zechariah chapter 14, it looks like an instantaneous uh, destruction of the wicked uh, by fire. Revelation 19.11 tells us, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Here's another example. How can you righteously make war? War brings destruction. Well, it's counted as righteousness in God's eyes. Now, somebody might say, well, the destruction of anyone, that's not a righteous thing. Well, we need to adapt our thinking to what God's word says. And according to God's word, when God destroys the wicked, it is a righteous thing. And so we need to start thinking along those terms. And, and as for me, it seems kind of foreign to what, the way God would work. But once we start to see the reasons why God has to do this, it starts to make so much more sense. I see it completely as a righteous act of God to destroy the wicked. Now, I had, uh, our family had a little white cat that had blue eyes. I don't know if any of you have ever had a little white cat with blue eyes. But apparently little white cats with blue eyes are, are, can be stone deaf. It's kind of a character trait with, with cats, I understand. That's what I was told. And this little cat, my father was visiting one time, and uh, this little cat was in his truck, either in the engine de- compartment or underneath it. I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but for some reason, it was, it was when, it, when he started up his truck, it got severely injured, and it was obvious to me that it could not survive in that condition. And I took it upon myself because I, my father felt so bad. And I took that little cat and I had to end its life because it was not going to survive. That is so vivid in my mind and so, in a sense, disgusting that I had to take the life of this animal. But I did it because I had mercy on that animal. All that animal was doing was suffering, and there was no way I could uh, bring life back to it. And so what I had to do is I had to destroy the life. This is a, a little tiny example of what God is going to do to the wicked. He's actually going to bring an end to suffering and guilt and shame and persecution that they're carrying out on the righteous. It's actually an act of mercy and justice and faithfulness and the truth of God that he judges the righteous worthy of execution because they have brought their own lives to a state of misery And they want to promote that misery on everyone else. And the thoughts of their hearts are consumed in evil. And this is just one of the reasons why God does what he does uh, by bringing judgment on the wicked. John chapter 5, Yeshua's own words here. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him, the Son, authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. This is really amazing in my mind. When we stop and pause here and have a look at what is going on here, the Father is not the one that's going to execute judgment on the wicked. Could the Father do that? Yes, he he could do that. Would he have full right to do that? Well, I would suggest that he doesn't. Now, somebody might say, well, he can, yes, he can do whatever he wants. But he has chosen to give that work to the Son of God because he is also the Son of Man. You see, the Son of Man was God in the flesh, if you will, 
living the life of man in the flesh, suffering the persecutions of the righteous in the flesh. And that's why God has given him the ability to execute judgment. It has been given into the hands of the Son because he's one of us. And so we can relate to him. We can relate to the persecutions that he felt because we're going to feel the same kind of persecutions that he felt. And he is worthy to be the judge of all the earth because he was the Son of Man. He goes on to say, Yeshua goes on to say, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in their graves will hear his voice. Now I want to ask the question, who are all? All would have to be those that have died in rejection of God's plan and those that have died in acceptance of God's plan. So Yeshua is very clear here that all who are in their graves will hear his voice. He goes on to say, and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, if we read that quickly, just as it is, we might say that that all happens at the same time. And it appears like it does all happen at the same time, and I've heard sermons on this that it all happens at the same time. But when we find additional information, when we get into more truth, this is why we need to study so we can find more truth on a subject that we may not understand entirely. If we just take one text here or one text there, we may not get the complete story. But when we get to the book of Revelation, we see clearly that there are two resurrections, just as Yeshua has said here. But those two resurrections are 1,000 years apart. Evidently, Yeshua didn't bring that truth forward, whether he understood that at that time in his life. I don't know. You could speculate that he knew all things. But um, he only knew what the Father revealed to him. And what clearly that he said was truth. There is a resurrection of life. In other words, the righteous. And there's a resurrection of condemnation, where the wicked will be condemned uh, to die. And that's what Yeshua was very, very clear on. I want to look at this in the APB Bible. It translates it just a little differently here. It says, and he gave, so we're looking at the 1-2. We put it in the order 1-2 here. And he gave authority to him, so the Father gave authority to the Son, even to execute judgment for he, the Son, is the Son of Man. So there's our reason again. Do not wonder at this, for it comes an hour in which all the ones in the tombs shall hear his voice, and they shall exit the ones doing good, unto a resurrection of life, but the ones acting heedlessly, so the ones that are not turning and responding to the call to life, the gospel, unto a resurrection of judgment. Uh, and this word judgment, 2920, we're going to look at this word judgment, how it's used, and that's very interesting as well. So there, it doesn't say that this is going to happen at the same time. Yeshua does not say that. He just says there is a resurrection to life and righteousness, and there's a resurrection to judgment. It's not until we get to the book of Revelation, of which he is uh, an author of uh, in the book of Revelation, and he explains that these two uh, resurrections are 1,000 years apart, and it has to be that way, and we're going to see that. This word judgment, it's where we get the word crisis. 29.20, Christus, uh, for or against. So a judgment for or against something. By extension, a tribunal. By implication, justice. Specifically, divine law. So God, in his justice, uses his divine law to determine whether people are going to be found in whichever resurrection they're going to be found in. 
This goes back also to the verse that we looked at last week when Solomon stated that after looking at the whole picture uh, that God had shown him, he said, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for he will bring every work into judgment. So God's commandments are going to be the basis of the judgment. There's going to be a couple things that are going to be very interesting in the judgment. Paul says that in times past, God has winked at. What does that mean, actually? Is that in the final days, the law of God is going to be manifest among his people, and it's part of the gospel. Part of the gospel is obey God and live. That's really the bottom line. That's what uh, that Solomon said. And so this message of God's law is going to be out in the open in the time of the end. It has not been out in the open in times past. That's why God is going to wink at their lack of understanding of God's law, those in the other nations of the world that have not had opportunity. But Paul also, in Romans chapter 2, says that the Gentiles do by nature the things that are contained in the law. They don't have the letter of the law, but they follow their conscience, which in John, first chapter, tells us that Yeshua is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. So every, I take that for just what it says, he lights every man, not just the Jew, not just the Christian, but every man that comes into the world has had the opportunity to follow the Yeshua through their conscience. He directs man through their conscience. So God is able to determine when people come up in the judgment whether they would follow him eternally or not. And that's the determination that he makes in the judgment before he comes back, which we're going to be looking at. A lot of people don't understand the concept of a judgment prior to his coming and then an ultimate judgment where everyone is involved at his after the millennium. We go on and sit in Revelation 19.11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So we've, we've seen that here. Is, uh, in this sense, judgment is 29.19, right, very same root as what we were looking at, properly to distinguish, that is to decide mentally or judicially, by implication to try, condemn, punish, avenge, conclude, condemn, damn, decree, determine, esteem, judge, go to, a law, ordain, call in question, sentence to, or think. So this is the righteous judgment in God that he has all the information he needs to make this righteous judgment. We can leave that with him. And he's going to prove that uh, in the, in the time during the millennium, all those judgments that he has made in times past will be proved to his saved during that time. And we're going to see that. Revelation 19, 12, and 16 goes on to say, His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he, sh he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And we're going to see a parallel text here as we go. In, in this. This is basically additional information pulled out of the Psalms, which we're going to see. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This is really, uh, the concept is taken from Psalms 2, 4-7. Now Psalms 2, 4-7 is very interesting 
Once we see this in the Psalms, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, the Psalms are revelations. They're prophetic. And this is no different in Psalms chapter 2. We see a prophecy, but we don't just see a prophecy. We see a conversation between, between two beings. We see the Father, and I've taken it, um, taken the liberty to put in the Father where I see fit. It's the Father, referring to the Father, and the Son where I see fit is referred to the Son. And there are many, many, many places in the Psalms where we can see this being played out. This is just one example. So we have, He, the Father, who sits in the heavens, shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I, the Father, have set my King, Yeshua, on my holy mountain. I, the Son, will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, the Son, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. So we can see here, it's a dialogue between the Father and the Son here. And this is how we can see that there are definitely two beings uh, at work. Ask of me, the Father, and I will give you the nations for your, the Son's, inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Now this is very interesting. Once we get to the New Testament, we see something very interesting is the Son inherits the kingdom from the Father, but we also inherit the kingdom from the Father. And Paul says that we are joint heirs with Yeshua. Very interesting. This is part of the gospel message where the saints are going to be co-heirs with Yeshua. Very interesting. You, the Son, shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a while. Blessed, all, blessed are all those who pr put their trust in him the Son. Very interesting. This is, you could take this and stick it right into the book of Revelation prior to Revelation 19. It's telling the same story. In fact, this is what Yeshua was referring to when he said, and this gospel of the kingdom will go to all the world. This is the last call to the kings of the earth, which are first and foremost in persecuting God's people in causing all to persecute God's people, this is the last call before their destruction. And we see their destruction. We see the culmination of this, the rejection of God and his son in the time of the end. And the destruction happens in Revelation 19, among many other places. Deuteronomy 7, 9, and 10. Therefore know that the Lord, your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Anyone that says that God's commandments were done away with at the cross, they haven't read this or they haven't understand it when they read it. Last time I checked, a generation is at least 40 years. Back then, it may have been longer than 40 years, but even if it's only 40 years, that would mean a thousand times 40 would be 40,000 years uh, that God keep, loves uh, those that love him and keep his commandments. So at least at the time of Deuteronomy, I don't know, 1400 BC, something like that, God would have mercy on those for a thousand generations, for 40,000 years that were still out in front that would mean we're still under the jurisdiction of God's government where his commandments are still valid. And in fact, when we get to the book of Revelation, it tells us that only those that keep his commandments will have a right to the tree of life. And that would mean those that do not keep his commandments don't have a right to the tree of life. And that would mean that they will not live forever. 
goes on in verse 10 to say, And he repays those who hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will, he will not be slack with him who hates him. He re will repay him to his face. Now, we, we look at this, but we don't see this coming to fruition until after the millennium. That's when God is going to repay those that were wicked to their face. They will get to stand in front of God and he will condemn them to their face. Well, why? Because everyone has a right to their day in court. They have a right to justify everything that they either haven't done or they have done. And they will get that opportunity in their day of court, which is going to be after the second resurrection, when all those who have died and are wicked will be raised to face their day in court. And this is a prophecy where when they are ultimately destroyed because of their rejection of God, he will repay them to their face. He will be standing right in front of them to their face. And this is kind of interesting because have you ever been condemned, just asking a question here, have you ever been condemned by someone and not be able to face their accuser? Well, I think we've all experienced that. A lot of people like to talk behind someone's back and condemn them behind their back. They're not big enough to stand in front of the person and condemn them to their face. But God is obviously big enough and righteous enough to be able to look at someone and say, you know what? You rejected me and therefore I have to reject you. And this is what God is going to do at the end of the millennium after the second resurrection. They will be in all fair, fairness dealt with and be able to have their day in court. In Job, it tells us something interesting as well. Job 21, 30, 32. For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. This is exactly what these other texts were just talking about. They are reserved for their day of doom. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. Speaking of a time of wrath where the wicked will be brought out of their tomb, this is exactly what Yeshua spoke about when he talked about the judgment. There is a day of judgment for the righteous, and they will be brought out of their tombs on the second coming. And the day of doom for the unrighteous, when all those that are wicked will be brought out, and that will be the day of wrath. This is what Yeshua spoke about. And then it goes on to say, who condemns his way to his face. Very interesting, again, it talks about the day that God will condemn the wicked to their face. They will get their opportunity to justify every wrong thing they have done and who repays him for what he has done. This is, this is the book of Revelation uh, in, in clarity here. Yet he shall be brought to the grave and a vigil kept over the tomb. So speaking of the wicked, a vigil is kept over the tomb. We know who they are and they will be brought out of the tomb at that time. I want to look at Psalms 89.14 in the APB. This is basically a direct translation from the Greek. Righteousness and equity are the preparation of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go forth before your face. So this word equity is kind of confusing. You want to look that up to uh, 29.17. And what that, this word is very much connected to the same word we looked at, at earlier. In some translation, it's actually uh, judgment. The word judgment is used that we're going to see. And this is the same root, basically, as crisis, crisis, where we get the word crisis. And uh, it comes from the same root of the Greek. And that's a decision function or the effect for or against, avenge, condemn, condemnation, damnation. 
and uh, basically the same meaning as, as the other words that we've been looking at when judgment is brought in. Here in the Hebrew, this word uh, judgment is used for the same uh, justice and judgment. And this is a little bit longer. We'll just look at this briefly here. Properly, a verdict. So there's going to be a time when God pronounces the verdict or the execution or the penalty for what they've done. And that's really what this, this all means uh, at the end when God executes the, the sentence upon the wicked. Isaiah 24, 19 through 22. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and will not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the, the host of exalted ones, and on earth the kings of the earth. This is talking about the second coming when Yeshua returns and, and saves those for eternal life and executes a punishment on those that are alive. He also punishes the host of the exalted ones. Who are those? Those are the evil angels that have been active in the lives of men and causing them or provoking them to do the evil that they've been doing in persecuting God's people. So this is talking about at the second coming. And it's very interesting how this proceeds. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison. And after many days, and I just stuck in here a thousand years because when it says many days, that can be a thousand years, it could be a hundred years, it could be a variable uh, amount of time. But when we get to the book of Revelation, we see the second coming, then we see a thousand years, and then we see that the wicked are brought out, out of their graves and they're punished uh, with everlasting destruction after the millennium. And this is what we will see with the evil angels as well. They get their punishment and we're going to look at that uh, as well. Revelation 24 to 6 tells us, And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. This is at the second coming. This is the righteous. Judgment now is not only uh, taken upon by Yeshua, but he actually asks us to be a part of that judgment as well. It says, Judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Yeshua, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and they had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Yeshua for 1,000 years. I don't want to get into it. I've gotten into this uh, in times past. In chapter 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation, it says that the 24 elders shall reign on the earth uh, future, this is a different reign. It says they're going to reign for a thousand years. It's not until after the millennium that they shall reign on earth. And we see that in Revelation chapter 22. Very clear. That's when the forever reign takes place. But this is prior to the forever reign. This is when the work of judgment, when we sit on thrones judging not only the world and angels, as we're going to see, but we will judge the 12 tribes of Israel, Yeshua uh, told, that, uh, told us that as well. So he go goes on to say here, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So at the beginning of the, uh, when Yeshua comes back, he raises those, as we saw, two resurrections. He raises the righteous, destroys those who are wicked that are on the earth, and then the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Those were those were not found worthy to be resurrected in the first resurrection. And I've put uh, parentheses around that. And we understand that 
parentheses and all the punctuation was, was added to the Bible. And some of it was not put in the right place because this really is confusing. Why would it say that some people are resurrected here? Obviously, if they were beheaded uh, for not worshiping the earth, for not worshiping the beast, and they lived and reigned, this would have to be a resurrection. But the rest of the dead live not again. So they're going to be raised at the second resurrection at the end of the thousand years. And then it says this is the first resurrection. Well, obviously the first resurrection is at the beginning of the thousand years uh, when the righteous are raised. And it goes on to really confirm that. It says, blessed is holy uh, is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but shall be priests of God and of Yeshua and shall reign with him a thousand years. So second time it doubled down on this, that they're going to reign with him for a thousand years during the millennium. And the millennium is specifically different. Why? Because they're reigning at the throne of God in the heavens, not on earth. And we're going to see that it's very clear as we look at scripture that they are reigning before the throne of God. And that's why there's two reigns. One is in the kingdom of heaven, and then the second one is after the millennium when the holy city comes down, and they will reign on the earth forever and ever after that. In Hebrews chapter 6, 1 and 2 tells us, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Yeshua, What's an elementary principle? Well, we have a thing in Canada. I don't know if it's called this in the United States. We go to elementary school. That's grade one, two, and three. At least that's what it was when I... And then you go up to what they call now, I think, middle school. And um, that goes up to grade seven. And then you become... I don't know. They break it down differently in the States. But it moves up to when, to when you're a senior in high school. So all this progression, well, the elementary principles would be the basics. It'd be some of the first things that you learn. And this kind of makes sense as we go. It says, let us go on to perfection. So we're going to leave the elementary principles and move on to perfection. So I would suggest that in order to move on to perfection, we've got to get into things that are not elementary, things that you know, we're going to have to get to be a senior in this understanding. So we need to move on to the, from the elementary principles. So Paul has named some of these things, the elementary principles, not laying again the foundation of repentance. So that would be the first thing. You know, when you learn about Yeshua, what do you do? You got to turn around. You start, you start doing good things. Repentance from dead works. That'd be like the first thing. And faith toward God. So you want to develop your faith toward God. These are the elementary things of the doctrines of baptism. So what is baptism all about? These are called elementary principles by the writer of Hebrews. And the laying on of hands. So basically that, the laying on of hands is an elementary principle. We see that in the Bible. And of the resurrection of the dead. Why are so many people confused on an elementary principle, the resurrection of the dead? The Bible is very clear. There are two resurrections. There is a resurrection when Yeshua comes back. That is called the first resurrection. There is a second resurrection. That is after the millennium. And that tags onto the next elementary principle, the eternal judgment. What is the eternal judgment? Well, the eternal judgment has everlasting effects. That's why it's called the eternal. This sentence at the end of the judgment is not going to be reversed at any time in the future. That's why it's called the second death. There is no resurrection. It says the second death has no power. Why? Because there is no resurrection after the second death. There is only a resurrection after the first death. 
There's a, we are guaranteed, if we are to die, if we do not live until the second coming of Yeshua, there will be a group of people, I believe there are 144,000 in number, that will be alive when Yeshua returns. They will not have seen death up until that point. But if we are to die, then we will die, we are guaranteed to die at least once if we do not live up until the second coming. You see, God has made it so we will all die once. That's in the government of God. We die the natural consequences of sin, the death that Adam earned because of his rejection. He ultimately died. Well, our lifespan is a lot shorter now, for good reason. Our lifespan is a lot shorter. And God has given us this life to determine whether we will be saved in the first resurrection or not. If we, are, if we chose not to be, then we will have the eternal judgment and we will experience the second death. The second death has not been determined by God to be poured out on the wicked. He's only required that they die once. We need to understand that. One thing that we need to understand is that God does not want us to die the second death. He only requires us to die the first death. And we see that here uh, in the book of Hebrews as well. Hebrews 9, 27, 28. And as it is appointed for man to die once, not twice, once. So God has appointed man to die once. Why? Because we get old and we get weak and we get frail, we get diseased, we get hit by a bus. And so this is the actual outcome of the first sin. The first sin of Adam and Eve, and we, we know the story all the way down. So God has appointed us to die once. He has determined that one life is all we need to choose whether we're going to follow him or not. And then he says, but after this is judgment. So we die once, and then the determination is made in the court of heaven, which we're going to see. The determination is made whether we are going to be raised in the first resurrection. And we should understand that God's universe is big enough that if everyone that has ever lived was raised in the first resurrection, there's enough room for all of us. And so God has allowed provision for everyone to be saved. This is what Peter talks about, is God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. That was God's plan. But of course, we know the end of the story, and not all people are going to accept God's plan. So they will suffer the second death. But God has not arbitrarily said that certain people will be saved and certain people will be lost. That determination of who is lost and who is saved is actually up to the individual. And God just determines the, the decision made by the individual. And he ultimately will give everyone what they want. So Yeshua was offered once to bear the sins of many, the sufferings of the Messiah, that's what Peter talked about. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation, and that's the glories that follow. So the prophets, in, in 1 Peter 1, verse 10, talks about the prophets searching diligently of the Messiah coming, the sufferings of the Messiah, and the glories that would follow. When Yeshua came the first time, that was when he suffered and bore the sins of many. And those that eagerly wait for him, those that are going to receive judgment when he comes, in Revelation it says that they, the question of the, of the wicked is asked, who's able to stand? And they hide themselves in the rock. They have a fearful, and they are fearful of the judgment and the execution of it at the second coming. But those who eagerly are waiting for him, that's the righteous, that's the righteous who are alive, he will appear a second time apart from sin. In other words, he's not going to deal with sin as far as making 
a provision for it. He's going to save those that have accepted what he has already done for their sins. In the, uh, in the Greek, in the basically a more literal translation, for as much as it has been reserved to men to once to die, but after this, the judgment. And this word judgment is that same word, the execution of judgment. So if we don't make it in the first resurrection, we are guaranteed to come up in the second resurrection. And this is the truth. And I believe this with all my heart. If people actually believed that they were going to be raised, no matter what they do in the flesh, they will ultimately be raised to a judgment of condemnation, and they will have to stand in front of God Almighty and face Him with all their sins and all their record of sins, and they will be condemned to death throughout eternity, will suffer the brunt of the second death, of which there is no res resurrection. I believe that this world would turn around to a great extent. Somebody might say, well, I don't really care. I don't want to live. And ultimately, that's the way a lot of people are going to make their decision. But to a great extent, people have lost the fear of judgment, and that's why they do the things that they do. And we can, whether it's the halls of government, or whether it's your next door neighbor, the way they act and react, uh, people have lost sight of the judgment and the reality of the ultimate judgment where everyone will stand before Yeshua, uh, the ultimate judge. In verse 28 of uh, chapter 9 of Hebrews, goes on to say, So also the Christ, once having been offered, bearing the sins of many, that at a second time, separate from sin, he shall appear to the ones waiting, awaiting him for deliverance. So at that time, he's going to deliver those that are waiting for him. And this has a, a Passover ring to it, and I, I really like that. Daniel chapter 7 talks about this judgment, this first judgment. I was considering the horns, the kings, uh, and there was another horn, another one, a little one, a little king, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns, or three kings, were plucked up out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and in mouth speaking great things. What happens here? I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Daniel 7, 10 through 12 goes on to say, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were were opened. This is the judgment prior to Yeshua's coming. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts or kingdoms, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I want to go to the chart here for a moment because we've been talking about this. It's really important that we understand the time frame of all of this. We've looked at this in, in other presentations. We see here, according to the words of Yeshua, that the time of the end starts with war. And then he goes on uh, with this war, goes through this time, and we see right pretty much, pretty close to the middle, we see a judgment. We see a judgment, bringing this one now into the, little bit into the picture. Uh, can you see that? Okay. 
So in this one, this is the same time frame that we were just looking at behind. In Daniel chapter 7, where we are right now, we see a lion that has eagle's wings. We have a bear. And this is what it's talking about. It gets down to the fourth kingdom. And during the time of the fourth kingdom, when it's speaking, when the little horn, it's uh, the mouthpiece of this whole new world order, when it's doing its thing, persecuting, making war against the saints, judgment happens. So there's a determination of who is wicked and who is righteous prior to the second coming. This is what this prophecy is actually talking about. And we get the rest of the story when we get to Revelation chapter 13. And we see when all of this, when they're operating separately, we see in Revelation where they all come together in this new world system where they're all working together uh, ultimately with the harlot of Revelation chapter 17, when the harlot is riding this beast that has all come together, the kings of the earth. And it is during that time, this is what this prophecy is indicating, it's during that time that we have the judgment. And when we understand the judgment and the sanctuary calendar, we can see when this actually happens. And of course, we get down to the deliverance down here uh, as well. So that's the time frame that we can see. And that's when we blend these prophecies and the festival calendar together. We not only know that there are two judgments that Yeshua spoke about, but we can know exactly when those are going to happen once we move into the prophecies because we know what follows these events. It's very clear goes on in Daniel chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Looks like there is a typo there. Daniel 7, 21 and 22. I was considering, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Until the Ancient of Days came in a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So that's when the kingdom will be given to the saints of the Most High, but that doesn't happen until after the judgment. So this is talking about that time frame that we're looking at here prior to the second coming. Now this goes into what we opened with, is this wicked world has become consumed in making war against the saints. Once that happens, it's time for God to act. It's time for God to act independently uh, and do what he needs to do. Revelation 4, 22 uh, to 4, we want to see something here very interesting. And, and this is an, another one of those repeat and enlargement that we've been looking at. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. So this is the throne room in heaven. Can't miss that point. This is where it is. This is not on earth. This is God's throne room where he's sitting, uh, likely today. And he's there, and this is referring to the same throne room uh, that Daniel was referring to earlier. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Question, who are these 24 elders? We're going we're gonna to find out. We looked at that briefly last week. But they are in the throne room of heaven. And from the throne, verses uh, 5 and 6 of chapter 4 of Revelation, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass. I've underlined that. We're going to come back to this point. So before the throne, there were these beings, these four beings, there was also 24 elders. Who are they? 
and there's a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the thrones, four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. So we've seen a description of this, this uh, throne room. Now when he had taken the scroll, verses 8 through 10, now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the throne, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Don't miss this point. So evidently, in the throne room, we've got 24 elders and these creatures around the throne, a sea of glass, and we've got these 24 elders that have the prayers of the saints. This has to be before the second coming because these are the prayers of the saints that they're offering up from the earth. Very interesting. What is going on here? These 24 elders, Yeshua has taken them to be priests and kings. They are sitting on thrones, but they're also doing the work of the priestly nature, and they're uh, accepting the prayer of the saints on behalf of Yeshua. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. For you were slain, speaking of Yeshua, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is beautiful. So these are people, prior to the second coming, that they make the declaration that they have been redeemed out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. They are asked to take part in the judgment prior to when Yeshua comes back. Now, if we can put two and two together and get four, I think we can do it. Yeshua was given the work by the Father of judgment because he was the Son of Man. He can relate to man, even though I think the Father can, but in his righteous judgment, he places one that became a man with us to be the judge. He not only stops there, he does not stop there. He's asked the 24 elders to do this work of judgment with him prior to the second coming. So we've not only got the son doing the work of judgment, we've got the 24 elders who are human beings as well to do the work and do it righteously prior to the second coming. If that isn't a fair judgment, I don't know what could be. God has asked his beings to take part in judgment with his son prior to the second coming. They will determine who is going to be saved and who is not going to be saved. It goes on to say, of the 24 elders that they declare that they have been made kings and priests to our God and shall reign on the earth. Now, if someone is on a throne and they are with Yeshua in the presence of God and they make the declaration that they shall reign on the earth, that is a future event. So the reigning on the earth was not taking place then, it will take place in the future. And we don't get to the reigning on earth until we get after the millennium, according to the word in the Revelation chapter 22. That's where it says that they shall reign forever and ever. They make the declaration when they're in heaven before the throne that they shall reign on the earth. When is this happening? This is happening prior to the second coming. So in God's fairness, he has the Son do the work of judgment. He has the 24 elders who were redeemed from the earth, were human beings, doing the work of judgment. Well, this is where it gets wonderful. Now, after the others are resurrected and taken to the throne room, they are also included into that work of judgment. This is the ultimate justice and fairness of God. We're going to see that here shortly. So in Daniel 7, 21 to 22, we saw 
that this judgment happens prior. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, we have what Paul says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, he's not saying that the dead outside of Christ will rise second here. He's just saying that they're going to rise first. And then he says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall always be with the Lord. So what happens second is that the ones alive and remain, 144,000, which I believe uh, to be those that will be alive at the second coming, will be caught up together to meet them in the air. So the question is, what's going to happen? This is the first resurrection. Then those that are caught up will meet them in the air. Then where do we go? We see where they go when we get to the book of Revelation. And uh, we see what they declare later on. In chapter 15 of Revelation, it says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. The seven last plagues are going to be poured out on the wicked prior to the second coming. But those that are in heaven, the 24 elders, make another declaration here. And I saw something like the sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had had victory over the beast and over, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing where? Standing on the sea of glass. We saw the 24 elders previously say that they are in the throne room and they had been redeemed. Now we see after the second coming, that they are that this number, this 24 number, has been added to, and we see another group of people, only this time they're standing on the sea of glass. We did not see that when we just saw the 24 elders. They were not there. This happens after the second coming. This happens after the resurrection. Those who had victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass. They were resurrected and taken now to the throne room, the same place that the 24 elders were earlier. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. Evidently, they're going to be able to look at how God has dealt in the past with everyone and the declaration, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. In other words, in a sense, God is the one that's being judged here and the declaration is made that God is just in all of his ways. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, and all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been made manifest. Ultimately, all those that are saved out of all nations will come and worship before God, and he will make all his judgments manifest. Revelation 7, 9 and through 12 show us another glimpse of this picture. And after these things I look and behold a great multitude which no man could number out of all nations, tribes, tongue, uh, peoples, and tongues standing before what? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Palm branches here, we see this in, um, in the book of, uh, I believe it's Matthew, when they're entering Jerusalem and Yeshua has this great throng of people and uh, it's the victory march into Jerusalem which is a type of the victory when Yeshua takes those that are saved into the throne room of heaven and presents them to his father after his second coming and they have palm branches in their hands 
and crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood all around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. I propose that this is an expanded view of what we're seeing in the book of Revelation after the resurrection that not only those that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, those that have been re resurrected in the clouds, and they will go to the throne room. And this is a picture now of not only the 24 elders and the four living creatures, but all those that are saved out of all nations. This is what we're seeing in the throne room. And this is at the commencement at the thousand years. And they say, Amen, blessings and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. This is after the second coming. Judgment is given to those, and it says, I saw the souls who had been beheaded for their witness to Yeshua, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast and his image, and have not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Yeshua for a thousand years. They will live and reign in the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, in the kingdom of heaven with Yeshua for that thousand years. That's why the thousand years here is mentioned as a thousand years. It's not the forever reign. If it was the forever reign, it would be redundant. It would be useless to say thousand years. Why not just say it, uh, the reign forever and ever? It isn't because the thousand year reign is completely different to the forever reign. The forever reign is after the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God after the millennium. The righteous reign and do the work of judgment. They have, God has asked them, as he has asked the 24 elders prior to the second coming, he has asked them to do the work of judgment. This judgment will be righteous in all of its ways, because we will have all the information. Have you ever make, made a wrong judgment in your life before? Have you ever come into more information and you can say, without a doubt, that I shouldn't have judged that person that way because you did not have all the information. This is something that we need to be aware of. We do not have all the information yet to make a righteous judgment, but the day is coming when we will have all the information and God has asked us to do that work of judgment on those that have not been saved so that we can demonstrate that God's judgment is righteous. Corinthians goes on to say, 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? This is the work that's going to be going on during the thousand years in the kingdom of heaven. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that you shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So during that time, God is going to ask us to do the work of judgment, not only with men, but with angels as well. Why is he asked to do that? Because at the end of the millennium, God is going to have to execute his work of judgment. The wicked angels will ultimately be destroyed. The wicked people that have chosen to reject God will ultimately be destroyed. And he has gave, given the work of judgment, given the work of homework to the saints so that when he has to do something that is foreign to his nature, the destruction of some of his creation, we're going to be at peace with it because we have been doing the work of judgment and investigating the works of God all the way through the millennium. So he tells us, do you not know that the saints will judge the world and if you are, will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Luke tells us, therefore, be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. 
During the work of judgment, we will be merciful. We will find mercy when we can. But I would propose that God's execution of the judgment at the end will be merciful upon those who suffer the brunt of the executive phase of judgment. Yeshua also said, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Very interesting here. This seems to contradict itself here. We've got a place in the Word where Paul says that we're going to judge the saints, we're going to judge angels, we're going to judge the world, and then Yeshua says, don't judge. Well, what Yeshua is talking about is in this life. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they had some people just condemned to die. You know, there's certain people that just cannot be saved. And I say, we need to really look at Yeshua's words carefully. In this life, we have to be careful about how we judge and who we judge, because we don't have all the information. However, in the millennium, all the information about every individual that will not be saved will be present in the courts of heaven. All the truth will be revealed. There will be nothing hidden that will not come to light. Romans 3, 4, and 5 tells us, Certainly not, indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you, God, may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Well, that's quite a thought, isn't it? The judgment, actually, during the millennium, is not so much of a judgment of, of the evil ones that are ultimately going to be destroyed. It's a judgment of God because the decision's been made, and we are determining whether God's judgment is righteous. And this is what we come to the conclusion at the end of the millennium, is that what God has to do in the destruction of the wicked, evil angels and men, is a righteous thing. He has to do it if we're going to enjoy the glories that are going to follow. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? So we as human beings, and, and I know people, say that God cannot destroy the wicked. That would be killing. We want to look at that for a few minutes. Actually, it cannot be said that God is unjust when he inflicts wrath. How will it not be said? Because the righteous will have opportunity and they will, it will be demonstrated that God is just when he inflicts wrath. Hebrews 10, 26, and 27 tells us, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. So if we reject Yeshua, especially after we come to a knowledge of him, there's no more sacrifice for sin. But what do we look forward to? But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and a fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, and this is, the, this is what it's talking about in the book of Revelation. Isaiah tells us a little more about this. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Shoal we, uh, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come upon us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. So the wicked somehow think they're going to avoid the, the sentence that's put upon them, but they will not avoid it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. In other words, if you believe in the foundation, if you, be, if, 
you believe in the stone, you believe in the precious cornerstone, the sure stone, Yeshua declared himself that he was the cornerstone. If we do not believe in him, we will act hastily. We do, will do what we shouldn't do and reject him. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and the righteousness the plummet. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the hiding place. This is the judgment we see in Revelation, the seventh plague, if you will where every island fled away, and we see hailstones about the weight, I believe, of a talent. The covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with death, or the grave will not stand when the overflowing scourge passes through. Then you will be trampled down by it. In other words, this putting off of judgment that they have put off, they have put off, keep putting it off, oh, it will not come near us, it actually catches up to them. As often it goes out, it will take you. For morning by morning it will pass over, and by day and by night it will be a terror just to understand the report, this understanding of destruction. For the bed is too short to stretch out on, and the covering so narrow that one cannot wrap himself. This is amazing. So have you ever slept in a bed that was too short? It's just really hard to get comfortable. There is no rest for the wicked. It's compared to sleeping on a bed that is too short. And they don't have covers that can cover them. This sounds a lot like Revelation when they, they are exposed exposed for what they really are. For the Lord will rise up on Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, and he will do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. When it, what is this talking about? That's talking about what we looked at last week when Joshua destroyed these, these people, these five kings, but it said that the Lord destroyed more than Joshua and the children of Israel by these hailstones that he rained down. This is a type of what it's talking about when God destroys the wicked at the end of the millennium. This is what's called his strange act when he takes the responsibility upon himself to destroy the wicked. He doesn't ask us to do it. In his righteousness, he does it in a way that no one else could do it. Now, therefore, do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. Be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a destruction determined even upon how much of the earth? The whole earth. All those that have rejected, this is the warning. There's a destruction determined. In other words, ahead of time, there's going to be a destruction. This is what people need to understand. They do not understand the concept of the judgment. There are many people that believe God won't destroy anyone. Well, this is not what the Bible teaches. If people actually believed that the wicked will come to an end, those that reject him will not live forever, and God will ultimately destroy him. The Bible is very clear, and the reason why it's very clear is so that people can make a turn in their lives before this happens. Before this happens, Isaiah twenty-eight, twenty-three to twenty-five. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen to my ear and my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning the soil and breaking the clogs? This is, a, this is so amazing, this little parable that we see here. We have just been shown that at some point, God's patience will come to an end and he will act and he will do his strange act. And then the little parable comes in here that says, does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? In other words, when I plant a garden, I don't just keep plowing and plowing and plowing. I have to plow a certain amount, but at some point, I drop a seed into the ground. 
In other words, I change what I'm doing. And this judgment is compared to that. God is not going to allow people to live forever in sin. At some point, he's going to do his strange work. This is the warning. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clogs? No. At some point, he stops turning the soil and breaking the clogs because it's time to plant. When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat in rows, the barley at the appointed place, and the spelt in its place? For he instructs him in righteous judgment, his God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is it cartwheel, cartwheel roll over it, over the cumin, but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. What is, what is going on here? What he's saying here is that God is going to stop giving mercy because his mercy is, has been rejected. He's going to stop mercy and he's going to execute judgment. We see it back here. There's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a resurrection. So we're moving along in his plan, just like the one that, that digs the soil. He turns over the soil. He tries to get it ready for planting. He plants the seed. God plants the gospel seed. What are we going to do with it? And ultimately, he likens it to this. So he takes it upon himself to start moving forward. Bread flour must be ground, therefore it does not thresh, he does not thresh it forever, break it with his cartwheel, or crush it with his horseman. So there is a work that the, the, the farmer does, and he moves forward until when? Until the harvest. That's what it's talking about here. And this is what God's going to do. This plan of salvation has been progressing all along the way, and God is going to bring it to an end. It's the end people don't like. And the whole plan is revealed in his word for us to see how it's going to end. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. Isaiah chapter 28, very interesting chapter. Now let's jump up to Revelation. This is how it's going to end. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. This is the second resurrection. He's released because now the wicked have been raised. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Wherever they died on the whole earth, whether that was prior to the second coming or at the second coming, they will be raised from wherever they are at the end of the millennium. And Satan will now have a work to do and he will go out to deceive the nations again just as he's always done. This demonstrates without a question to the righteous is that there's no more that God can do for these people. They come up out of their graves with no change of mind and they go out and they are deceived again by the arch deceiver and they take his side again. They went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints, which has come down at the end of the millennium. We've looked at this so two, three weeks ago, and, be, and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Very clear. The Bible's very clear. This is that act of God when he takes it upon himself and he does what he needs to do because of the ultimate rejection of him. And somebody may say, well, you know, God's kind of stern. He destroys the wicked just because they don't want to do it his way. It's not like that at all. Actually, the reason why he has to destroy them is because their lives would be miserable through eternity. Destruction, covetousness, adulteries, it would last throughout eternity if God didn't bring it to a close. It has been seen through the judgment, not only the judgment before the second coming, but during the millennium that God will have no more uh, ability to save to the uttermost 
because they have rejected him to the uttermost. And he will ultimately destroy uh, the evil angels with the wicked. And that's after we have done the work of judgment on the world and the evil angels. The devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire with, and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And someone might say, well, that's just the devil. Well, we want to read on. No, it's not just the devil. It's all of his angels, which that fire was made only for the angels, not for wicked men. Yeshua spoke about that, that there's a fire that was prepared for the angels. And he, he warned us ahead of time that we don't want to go into that fire and we need to um, do what he wants us to do. Goes on and repeat an enlargement here. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose, whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to, the, to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This would suggest, I would say very strongly, that there are going to be people that are not found written in the book of life, and those are those that came up out of their graves in the second resurrection, that, that the devil deceived them again, and the deception, the lie that he has told from the beginning is, thou shalt not surely die. That's why they come up and surround the city to have access to the tree of life, and enter into the city and take the city. And God says, uh, this far and no further. And the fire comes down and destroys them before they get into the city. Matthew 10, 28 tells us, And do not fear those who kill the body, that's the persecution, but cannot still, uh, kill the soul, but rather fear him, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, hell is, is a place, but it's more an event than it is a place. It's what we just read about in the book of Revelation chapter 20. In Luke, it's told a little differently, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, Fear him. I would propose that, that Yeshua is not talking about Satan here, but is talking about the final destruction of the wicked after the millennium. This is what he's talking about. And somebody said, well, God can't kill. Well, just a minute here. Let's look at this, shall we? Thou shalt not kill. You shall not murder. This is what it says here. In most translations, very interesting, Thou shalt not kill is only in uh, less than half of the translations. It's used, the word is murdered. I would suggest, as we look through all these different translations, that the word kill is used less often because the actual intent is that murder is the intention. Murder is taking it upon yourself to kill someone when they haven't done really anything to deserve it. You've done it. You've taken it upon yourself to kill someone unjustly. And somebody might say, well, there's never a time of just punishment. Well, we've seen that God is going to take it upon himself. He has in times past, at the time of the flood, at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, which are both examples of the time of the end, the destruction of the wicked, he will also take it upon himself to do that as well. I would suggest the way that these words are used in the Ten Commandments is God does not kill the execution of the wicked in the time of the end, is more putting them out of their misery 
then it is murder. It's, it's doing away with all unrighteousness so we can get to an eternity of no more pain, no more suffering, no more anxiety, no, none of these things because God has dealt with what he needed to deal with and that is those that love these things. Revelation 25, 7 and 8, we want to look at this. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Go deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, to battle those whose number is as the sand of the sea. Can you picture all the wicked that have ever lived and raised at the end of the millennium and they are raised to life, and Satan goes to deceive them and rally them as his troops to take the city. It says that they went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We can see clearly here, if we compare this with Zechariah chapter 14, where the eyes dissolve and the mouth dissolves, this is such an instantaneous destruction of the wicked. I'm not so sure how much suffering is going to go on. The suffering the wick of the wicked actually happens every day in their life. It's called living with your conscience. And uh, that's why it says there's no rest for, uh, for the wicked. And ultimately, prior to Yeshua's coming, those that live to the, see the second coming will be tormented with a righteous judgment called the seven last plagues. And that will be a righteous judgment and that will be when God's judgment will be have made manifest on the earth. So here we see the final destruction of wickedness. And then the king will say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then shall he say unto them on his right or his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. It's interesting to note that this does not happen until after the millennium. It will be after the millennium that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor uh, there shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. We pick up the rest of the story in Isaiah. 65, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, for the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Is that not an incredible promise that our griefs and our sorrows and our pains that we have felt on this earth, and I know many of you have felt far greater things, far worse things that I've felt, but we have all seen pain, at least to some degree, how God is going to do it, I'm not sure. But I think the glories that are going to be given to the people of God is going to go a long ways in forgetting the pain that we have felt here. We will not remember our former pains and griefs that we bore. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create a Jerusalem as a rejoicing and people and her people a joy. I propose that because the New Jerusalem was never mentioned in the Old Testament, it was almost, it would seem not seen to a degree, but this is the same promise that we find in New Jerusalem that will be poured out on the heavenly Jerusalem that comes down out of God. I will rejoice in Jerusalem in the joy of my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her 
nor the voice of crying. This is exactly what we see after the millennium. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For the days of the tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor shall bring forth children for trouble. And they shall be the descendants and the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountains, says the Lord. We can be thankful that God has a plan, and he's laid it out for us to see how and when certain things are going to be happening. And ultimately, we can rest assured, as God's word says, that he's going to make it all right. He will take away all the suffering and he will repay those that have waited for him with joy and gladness throughout eternity. Does God have a limit to his patience? How does he execute punishment? Number one, he removes his protection and number two, the two main ways is he acts for himself. There is a time when God will act for himself for those that have rejected his government and his ways. And he will execute judgment for himself. So at the beginning, we know. In the beginning, what did God do? So we're going to start this thing in the beginning. We know what he did. Way back then, in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. Whenever that was. Some say it was 6,000 years ago. I don't know about that. He might have created all this long, long time ago, um, but created man and started decorating this earth uh, 6,000 years ago. That's kind of the way I look at this thing. Uh, right or not, I don't know if it makes a lot of difference. If somebody has a different idea, I'm, I'd welcome the thoughts. So in the beginning, we know that Satan went and rebelled against God. We know that. Satan's fall. And then after that, sometime after that, God created man, the creation of man. So that's another starting point. We don't have any knowledge of how long that was. Could have been eons. But after the creation of man, I don't think it was very long that man fell. And we know the story. We're not going to get into that. Sin enters the world and death came upon all men. We know that. And then as soon as sin entered and death was pronounced, death sentence was pronounced, there was a sacrifice for sin. If there had not been a sacrifice for sin when sin came in, man would have died forever at that point. But God created a system, and during our lifetime, we would be able to decide whether we want to follow that system or not. Also in there, there was a sanctuary, and we see that. There was a, a lamb that was slain. At the beginning, they were given skins, and that would have meant the death of something. Uh, we're told in the book of Revelation that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Yeshua, in a sense, was slain from the foundation of the world. This is evidence because man did not die back then, but provision for his life was made in the death of the lamb, which prefigured the death of Yeshua. So man was able to live, but he would not be able to live forever under those conditions because he was removed from the garden. Man's wickedness became so great, and 1,500 years later, God brought a flood. We know that story. So man's wickedness it came to the point where God acted and did a reboot, if you will, to demonstrate where man would go again. So we've seen how God has worked in the past. He brought in a new world for man to start again. 
And we know what happened um, after that. Abraham and Isaac, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And we know that, uh, that Sodom and Gomorrah, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot happened and God rained down fire again. This was only 500 years, approximately 500 years after the flood. So we're, we're shown again out of the gate when it was only righteousness. In 1,500 years, man was at the point of destroying everything that was good. God brought on the flood. And then only 500 years later, man comes to, in certain parts of the earth, God brings this to a close for them because they were uh, only thinking of evil continually. Then 2,000 years go past after that, we see the first coming. What happens at the first coming? Yeshua is born. Is, have you ever heard anyone ever say, you know, and I've had people say this, this is why I know people think it, um, why doesn't God just come down and tell us what we should do? Well, he did, and that was at the first coming. He was born, and then when he started his ministry, it was a very short period of time that they killed him. So I would propose that if he came again in the flesh, as he did the first time, it wouldn't take very long for us to kill him again. And uh, those people that choose him would be outnumbered by those that want to kill him, and they would do it again. So no, he's not going to do this again. He's already done it. And if anyone wants to know the history of that event, everyone in the world living now will have opportunity to read this book and find out what happened the first time. This is why God is not going to do this again. So we see hundreds of prophecies about the first coming, and all of them have been fulfilled to the letter. All the ones that were to be fulfilled have been fulfilled to the letter. That gives us confidence that the ones about the second coming, which there are many, many more, are going to be fulfilled as to the event and the timing of those events. We saw in the first coming, the death of Yeshua was prophesied. We see his birth was prophesied. We see the details of being sold out for silver. We see, you know, by his stripes we are healed. There are just many, many prophecies that go through his whole life, basically, and cover the life work of Yeshua at his first coming. We can read about that in the Word. And uh, we even, our time, you know, A.D. and B.C., now that they've tried to change that, like they've tried to change everything, um, you know, the wokeness of the world has even changed that common era and before common era to get rid of what? To get rid of God, ultimately. Destruction of Jerusalem. We see because Yeshua was rejected, we see the destruction of uh, Jerusalem and the Jews are dispersed into all the world and the gospel went to the whole world and that's what we, that's where we are because we've heard that gospel call um, after the destruction of Jerusalem. And lo and behold, another 2,000 years, just like the 2,000 years from Abraham, from Abraham's call to the first coming was uh, pretty close to 2,000 years. Another 2,000 years after the gospel went, um, we are going to have the second coming. What's going to happen there? The first resurrection at the second coming, the 144,000 living and dead in Christ will meet in the air. The wicked living will be slain by the brightness of his coming. The 144,000 living and dead in Christ taken to heaven where they will reign for 1,000 years. Not forever and ever. They will reign for 1,000 years and do the work of judgment. According to the word, that's what it says. Judgment of the world and angels will take place during that time. Another thousand years goes by. We have the millennial rest. The millennial rest will happen and then the work of judgment at the third coming. What happens at the third coming? 
That is the turning of the page from the close of the 7th millennium into the 8th millennium, the time of new beginnings. And now we see that. We have the second resurrection of the wicked. We have Satan released, it says, for a little while, as we talked about. New Jerusalem descends in view of all the wicked. And Jude talks about that Enoch prophesied that the Lord will come. Let's read that. This is really, really an important text here. This is what Enoch had prophesied in the book of um, where Jude brings this out. Now, Enoch, this is Jude chapter, or, uh, chapter 1, of course, um, verse 14. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, The Lord comes with ten thousands, not just ten thousand, ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. That's at the end of the millennium. So, at the end of the millennium, at the eighth millennium, the third coming, he comes with all the saints who have spent the thousand years in the kingdom doing the work of judgment. Jude says that they come to execute judgment on all, to convict all. And notice the word all here. The word all is very significant because it's all those that have hung on to wickedness, to convict all. So what do you do in a court setting? You convict. That's what happens. You convict all their, of their ungodly deeds which they have committed in, their, in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is the final judgment that is executed on the wicked. This is what happens at the end of the millennium. That's the eternal judgment or the judgment that is eternal. There is no resurrection after that. It's over. The curtain closes. Wicked angels and people are destroyed. At the beginning of that is eternal glory. Um, sorry, at the end when everything's destroyed. That's when the glory of eternal life really sets hold. That's when the new heavens and a new earth. The stuff they're putting up in the heavens, it's no wonder they're going to have to uh, be dissolved to get rid of all that stuff that's up there. Um, that man has put up there. New heaven and a new earth. The sanctuary message, all the way that God has redeemed through the sanctuary, all the different things of the sanctuary, the judgment, the redemption, the first fruits, the resurrection, all these things that the sanctuary uh, was pointing forward to will come to a close because this plan of salvation is how God is going to deal with sin and redeem man and put him back on this earth with a new heaven and a new earth. The Jubilee will also be fulfilled, the longest time period on the festival calendar, when this world will be given back to those that it rightly, rightfully belongs to. That does not happen until after the millennium. Revelation chapter 20 through 22 are, is very clear on that. That's when the saints will reign on earth forever and ever. So there are two reigns portrayed in Revelation. One is a work of judgment in the courts of heaven. That's the reigning for a thousand years. And then there will be a forever reign. That's when the saints come down, as it's recorded in Jude and in the book of Revelation, where they come down uh, in the holy city to execute judgment. So this has taken 7,000 years. Wow. Well, if we remember, a 1,000 years is like a day, and a day like a 1,000 years. To God, 7,000 years is really just a, a brief moment in time. But for us, it's been a, a long time coming. And that's why we're told that we have to hang on, because time just seems to keep going and going. So eternity will start to stretch at the end of the millennium, and that's when God will turn this whole thing, he will turn the eight on its side and turn it into a forever reign in the new earth. This is what we're looking forward to. 
and people say, well, is it going to take another thousand years? Well, that's probably not going to seem like a long time uh, in our immortal state in the kingdom of heaven. So this is, um, this is something that you may want to download once we get it up on the internet to, um, as just sort of a, a brief. And, and it would be interesting to go now and start putting texts and you could basically pull them out of the presentation and put all the text in here to get this. So there, there we have it. There's the summation of this, uh, of this plan that has been unfolding through the ages as God has led out in this. All right. So let's, let's have a word of prayer, and if any comments after that, we can, we can do that as well. Father in heaven, we thank you for your plan that is pretty comprehensive. But Father, we ask that you help us to understand it in a way that we can make sense out of it, not only in our own minds, but when we share it with others. We ask you to be with us now as we go from this meeting through the week, we ask that you continue to work on our hearts to draw us closer to you each day. We ask that you finish the work that you've started. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.